Well, let's go back to the question, which is what is school for? Like, why are we even spending trillions of dollars to do this? If all we're trying to do is indoctrinate people, if all we're trying to do is get them to do what's on the test, well then, basically we should switch to artificial intelligence and let computers do it. I think the worry that we have, my wife and I have, is um, how life ready are they gonna be? And, and what's the world gonna look like? Because I think there's all these things that you think about with climate change and when too much technology and artificial intelligence and all these things that are happening. So I think I, I don't as much worry about my kids as I worry about what the heck's the environment, what's the world going to look like, and then how ready are they to navigate whatever gets thrown at them. What is this AI going to do? What's technology going to do to us? What's it going to do to jobs and society? And while that's an important question, I think in many ways it's the wrong question because technology doesn't decide what we're doing. Technology is not destiny, we shape our destiny. And ask them what they believe will be the most employable skill sets of the next decade. And the answer they'll give you is that the ones that will be the hardest to program into AI. And then if you ask them what those skill sets that are, are they, they'll tell you uh, the ones with which we were born. We were all born a child. You didn't play with the toy, you played with the box, the toy came in, it was your rocket ship, it was your fort, it was your castle. Um, we're all born with amazing intuition. We have 120 billion neurons in our first brain, 100 million neurons in our second brain. The brain with which we make most of our decisions as consumers when we say we went with our gut. We used to ask why, why, and why again until we went into first grade and we were told to stop asking why because there's only one right answer. Shortly before we were told to cut it in between the lines. Um, and we all have an amazing imagination. We still have amazing dreams today. And these will be the most, I believe, these will be the most employable skill sets in the next decade simply because they will be the hardest to program. The problem is by the time we're 18, we've stopped asking why and we've been told we're not creative and it's all about reminding people that they are creative and giving them the tools to do the job. I love to read literature and, and learn about my kids' education and it was talking a lot about those 21st century skills and that intrigued me and, and you know, how we teach now is you know sometimes how we've always taught and, and maybe there is a different way. We are coming out, we hope, of a global pandemic that has had massive disruptions on every aspect of our lives for the past two years. Uh, and they have had massive, the, the pandemic has had a massive disruptive effect on schools and education as well. And I think the opportunity that we have right now is to reconsider and to reimagine everything because we've seen that many of the constraints, many of the expectations that we thought were permanent are actually not, they're self-imposed. These are systems and structures that we created if we can recreate them. Simple things like where does learning occur? Does it have to be in a school? Can it be in your house? Can it be in your community? We've seen it doesn't have to be in a school because schools were shut down. You know, measuring learning based on a standardized test we were unable to implement standardized tests because the conditions were not right to even consider that. The results wouldn't have meant anything meaningful. Students were still learning. There were other ways that we could demonstrate learning. These assumptions that we had about the permanence of these industrial age structures should be reconsidered. And now is the time, now it's the perfect time for us to reimagine what's possible for each and every learner. I would want people to know how powerful the future is if you put it in the hands of our kids. And that it's hard, this job is hard to do by yourself. In order to really amplify what kids can do, you've got to find a group. You've got to work together. Uh, I just cannot imagine what one brain, what my one brain could do. Um, if I were all on, uh, by myself, could I be where I am right now? Could we have done what we've done in six years if we were all in the four walls of our classroom? And I think you'd find a resounding no. The alternative is to realize that what school is for is to teach kids to be leaders, to solve interesting problems, to lean into problems. We can't do that from a rigid curriculum because no two kids are the same. The only way we can do that is with a human being on site who will create the conditions for them to learn. It can happen at our public schools yeah. that this whole notion of we can't do that because is 
totally not right. 65% of children entering primary school will hold jobs that do not currently exist. 44% of executives say that incoming graduates do not have the skills they need to be successful. And by 2025, 42% of workplace tasks are set to be automated. However, like Eric reminds us, technology doesn't shape our destiny, we shape our destiny. And if indeed we have the power to shape our destiny, what are the skills and mindsets we need to be successful? How will we learn them and who's going to prepare us? To explore this very question, I welcome you to Design 39. Hey, hey Sava, how are you? How Good to see you. you. Thanks. Come on in. Too. Yeah. So excited to be here today at Design 39 and really just interested in learning what it is you guys do and what it is you stand for. Yeah, we really want to be able to answer those questions in a simple uh, statement. So we have life ready thought leaders elevating humanity. So really that why, how, what. So at the end, we, it's not around can our students have the highest GPA, it's around can they make an impact. So elevating humanity. And how do they do that? Thought leaders, so we want them to be inquiry based and curious about the world around them. And ultimately they can pivot, they can address the world in no matter what comes their way, so life ready. I want to take you back to the year 2007. It's a year that Thomas Friedman called an inflection point. Why? Because it's the year the iPhone launched. But that wasn't all. It was the year that technology like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube were becoming mainstream. Apps like Airbnb and Kindle were being launched that today we couldn't even imagine our lives without. It was also the year that I graduated as a first year history teacher. Yet just a few months later, we would enter the Great Recession. So while some people were creating new products and services based on emerging technologies, others like myself were being laid off and struggling to adapt to a world that was rapidly changing. Why? Well, the difference was some people had been taught to be learners. Others were just students. It's the difference between being asked, what energizes you? What are your strengths? What are you excited to be a part of? What emerging technologies are you excited about? Versus being asked, what job do you want to do? What major do you want to choose? And it wasn't until I read this line by Seth Godin from his book, Lynchpin, that I was able to turn things around. So the word linchpin comes from the old Wild West and wagons have four wheels and wooden axles and the thing that holds the wheel on is a little tiny piece of metal called the linchpin. And if that little tiny piece of metal breaks, the whole wagon stops working. And we have built an industrial economy designed to eliminate whenever we can linchpins to train kids to become cogs in the system. The reason org charts have square boxes on them is because if you leave, we can find someone else to take your spot. And I believe that humans and our culture are best served when human beings become something bigger than that. Something individual, something special, somebody we would miss if they were gone. It doesn't mean that anyone is indispensable. They're not. When we're gone, the planet will still be here. But it means that seeking to lean into those edges is worth something. I graduated in 2020, yet another inflection point. My school experience hadn't changed much from 2007, but the world was drastically different, and so was I. This time, instead of walking into the world to just get a job, I was walking into the world as a learner, ready to be part of creating a solution to one of the most pressing challenges of our time eradicating the industrial model of school. And we have on the board student versus learner. And we're, we're trying to get them to understand because they, they, a lot of them came in and they were still acting like students, which was making me have to act like a teacher. Um, so we did this little discovery about how do we take, you know, what does a student do and what does a learner do? Like a student would wait for the adult to teach them something. What does a learner do? When a learner wants to learn something, there's no stopping them. You know, they're going to figure it out. Nothing's going to be handed to you on a silver platter. And we're teaching kids that if you want something, go get it. So learner-centered education is, is a different paradigm. Instead of focusing on standardization, compliance, that factory model, seat time, 
outcomes like uh, attendance and uh, standardized tests. In a learner-centered model, it begins with the learner. Who, who am I as an individual? What are my strengths? What are my interests? What are my values? How can I connect with others? How can I build empathy, curiosity? How can I, how can I make a positive difference in my community? Uh, and the whole concept of learner-centered for me came from just listening to students. So when I was a superintendent, I started to do these student forums and I was asking students questions. What did they like about school? What would they want us to change? Uh, and that input led us to create a different model of teaching and learning that was way more effective. So being learner-centered is really about being responsive to learners, listening to them, taking their input into account, realizing that none of us are passive vessels. We, we know that, we all have an identity, we have agency, we have autonomy, we make choices. In a learner-centered model, you see that as an advantage instead of a deficit. It's something that we can build on. And so we can together co-create, co-construct, co-design learning outcomes, whole learner outcomes that are relevant and meaningful. We can co-construct and co-design meaningful learning experiences that are authentic, inclusive, equitable. And we can create the enabling conditions for these experiences to take place to achieve these learner outcomes, but it all starts with listening to learners. Is it working, what they're doing over there at Design 39, and how are those kids going to do when they get to high school? Huh? You know, but we're teaching for life. We're teaching problem solving and, and kindness and just human connection for life um, every day when they walk out this door, not someday when they go to college. They need to do this. Um, it's what's now. So there's this I don't know if it's pressure, but there's always that spotlight of how's it working, what's going on, and you know, parents are curious because it's not the way we went to school. It's not the way they went to school. Most people think um, when we say, oh, we go to Design 39, and they think, oh, that's the technology school, or the robotics, or the coding. And I'll be honest with him, that was never his superpower. Um, he didn't love building with Legos. You know, that that reminded me of. You know, it's okay we didn't make the choice to go to design for those purposes. We made the choice for him for those 21st century skills that he was learning, those soft skills that you're learning as you're going through that design process. Um, and now he's in high school and he can verbalize and he um, shared with me just the other day, you know, that I feel confident when I'm in a group and I'm asked to do a project and I can just go for it and, and think outside of the box. And he senses it and he feels confidence in that. And it's really awesome. He went and spoke with um, somebody that was um, working for our district leading our lunch program um, and asked about how much plastic sporks were being used. And then he did the math and figured out how many was you know, being used across the district. And you know, really did a bunch of math, connected with a company that was doing bamboo sporks. Um, and he was working to try and get, the ch get it changed so he can stop some of the pollution that we're causing. You know, and this is a third grader, and he's empowered to go ahead, like, go. You know, as you're doing this business, yeah, you wanna make a change, like, see what you can do. So our kids, um, getting them to be empowered and have that voice and understand that it's not, you know, you see a lot of stuff that says, what are you gonna be when you grow up? Or are you gonna, you can do something when you grow up, you can change the world. No, you can do it right now. <laughs> I, I'm a teacher, so I'm a big fan of education like you are, and, and I think we should invest more in it. It's a huge wealth creator. My, my colleague, uh, Eric Hanushek, has documented that, and there's many others. But it's not enough to just invest more in it. We need to fundamentally reinvent education. For most of the 20th century, uh, education was teaching us a lot of uh, facts and, and rote learning. We'd sit in rows of desks and memorize things. Well, those are things that those are techniques that machines are very good at. What we need to do going forward is think more about how to ask the right questions, how to think of new things that haven't been covered before, new discoveries, focus on new types of work. Um, and that's something that requires more creativity. We also need more teamwork, working together in partnerships. That's also something machines are not very good at. The, the short answer is to focus on the things that are uniquely human strengths, not the things that machines are already doing well. And that requires a new kind of education. At its heart, design thinking is about solving for the, with a problem with the consumer in mind or your particular target audience. And so it's how do you put yourself into the, that insight of the consumer? 
One of the ways we do it is by, by reframing the question. Right? Walt was a genius of design thinking. When he opened the doors to Disneyland on July 17, 1955 at 9.01am, Walt simply uh, said, we will not have any customers in our park, we will only have guests. Now think about how you feel when you're treated as a customer, but you know how you feel when you're treated as a guest. He said, not only that, we will not have any employees, we will only have cast members. Cast are a role in the show. And with that simple re-expression of the relationship between the employee and the customer as the cast member and the guest, putting the guest at the forefront, not the customer, Walter created a level of hospitality that's rarely been replicated since. So how does this tool work? Well, so for example, if you or I were asked to go into business and open a car wash, and I would ask you to name the essential ingredients we must put in a car wash, and I would ask you to write down a list, I guarantee you the first right word you would write down is water, followed by soap, brushes, dryer, vacuum, cars, and a cash register. But if I were to ask you to develop an auto spell, Suddenly I were here, masseuse, aromatherapy, cucumber water, candles, champagne and robes. Which one would you rather go to? <laughs> All I did was re-express the challenge through the eyes of the consumer. Now in 2011, if we'd asked the question, how might we make more money? We'd have put the gate price up at Walt Disney World by 3% and we'd have made our quarterly results. If you know the answer, you're iterating. If you're scared, you're a bit, you're innovating. Never heard of design thinking before I got here. And so it was all new to me, but it was it resonated so well because it was everything that I was already doing on my own in my brain. But it just made more sense now that it is laid out like step one, step two, and, and how it all goes. And we'll see design thinking as one like science activity. We design think everything from our rules to problems that come up in class to the playground. It's all through the day. So they're looking for problems that more cause this. Yeah. I've spent the past decade exploring how we can use an approach called design thinking and education. It's used by the world's top companies like Apple and Google and IBM and more to keep innovating and adapting. So why design thinking? Because it teaches both skills and mindsets. So often when we think about change in education, we know why things need to change. We even know what works, yet we feel so overwhelmed. Design thinking helps you take a step back and say, what challenges it do you have? And how do you turn those into opportunities? It takes all the ideas that we have about the things that we want to see happen in education and turn them into impact using specific structures that guide you every step of the way. Design thinking is more of a mindset than a skill. And uh, it's made me very aware now when I meet people and work with other people who are design thinkers and who are not and design, non-design thinkers immediately go to problems and cycle through problems. I, I see it in kids, I see it in my own family members, I see it in friends. It's the focus on the problem around and around and not moving forward. And design thinkers, I know in my, in, in my head now, after living it for so long, that my mind immediately goes to solutions. How could I solve this? How, how about this or this or this? It's almost become, I think, a habit for yes. us. And that's how we see things. And I see how we implement it, not just through curriculum, but I think when socially kids are having problems, instead of just focusing on what's your problem, what are you gonna do about it? Like, let's design a solution and let's see that that solution works. And if not, okay, let's go back to the root of the issue. Let's think of that empathy piece. So we've incorporated it, not just in, okay, let's do design thinking projects. It's now just become a way of thinking. It's how we plan as well. We are living the design thinking process and then we're incorporating it into our classrooms. So it is now, after practice, it's now naturally where I think year one and two, we did a lot more like, we're doing a design thinking project because that's, we were still very new at it. And now it's just, I think, embedded in how we are teaching, how we are planning, where it's not, everything is a design thinking now. And then it's not just, one project is going to be design thinking. We are living the design thinking process every day. They're getting survival skills and they're learning how to be critical thinkers. They're learning how to research. They're learning how to have confidence. I just look at it as a process, a process in my mind that we kind of go through naturally, I think, as teachers. And so with the design thinking process, I feel like it's codifying what we do. And so we start off always 
in empathy, and I think empathy is the heart of design thinking. That's the difference between the design process and design thinking is that empathy piece. And so we're problem solving, really. What are we problem solving for people? And so this entire process that we go through with brain dumping, trying it, getting feedback, coming back to it again to make sure that we were insightful about what the problem really was for the users and we continue around this process mm -hmm. to fine tune a solution, to me is the design thinking process. Mm -hmm. Design thinking is a creative problem solving method that is unique from other frameworks because it begins with empathy. In this first stage, we put aside our assumptions to identify the challenge we need to solve for by learning about the people we're designing for. Too often, we move forward with solutions without giving careful consideration to what problem we're actually trying to solve. As we quickly learn, when we begin with empathy, what we think is challenged by what we learn. The next phase of the design thinking process builds on the empathy work in the first stage and asks us to define the problem that we've identified using the sentence starter, how might we? How might we implies optimism, that there is a way and that we don't have to do this alone. We often say if we only had more money, more resources, more time, then we could achieve what we hoped for. We often don't and design thinking practices help us create solutions within our constraints. The third phase in the design thinking process is ideation. This stage prevents perfection, which often prevents our ideas from being introduced into the world to see how they can evolve. Instead, you're encouraged to come up with any and all ideas. Because in the next phase, the prototype phase, we're going to narrow down the idea to what we want to implement first to get feedback. And this brings us to the last two phases in the design thinking process, testing and iteration. As we create and launch our ideas, we recognize that our first try is not our last try. Design thinking is a cycle, and when we create cultures of innovation built on these design thinking practices, it becomes the way we work, the way we create, and the way we solve for challenges, and above all, the way we open the door to opportunities. It moves us away from feeling overwhelmed about change to having the structures and support to scaffold our conversations and strategies that build trust and create a shared vision in our organization. I think for me, that first moment was when I walked into his classroom or homeroom, as we call it, um, is not seeing desks and chairs like in a traditional setting where, you know, the teachers on one side and the students on the other side. And by seeing these foldable white tables, seeing modular furniture, uh, seeing that the walls were didn't have hundreds and thousands of things on there, it was clean, and it was a very, you almost felt like you were going into this sort of, you know, call, call it quirky, but you're almost going into this place of meditation, if you will. Like you're just going into this peaceful place where you can create what you want to create out there. And I think the first time I walked into the classroom, I, I still remember feeling very, like, it was like, wow, what an amazing environment, you know, that that my son can walk in here free and, and peaceful and he's able to create his own learning. And I think, you know, they had a, I had an opportunity to come, uh, come into the classroom when he was going, through, during the school day, I think, uh, this was the first year, and it just completely changed my perspective. I was like, if this is what Design 39 is gonna be like, and I, I, for me it was like, oh my God, why did I not go through this kind of an opportunity or this kind of a system for me? So I think that changed my perspective. It was definitely an aha moment for my wife and I because, you know, I think between the two of us, I was more of the risk taker and she's more of the cautionary person. And I think we kind of keep balancing ourselves. Sometimes I go the extreme, sometimes she goes the extreme. We kind of pull each other along. I think this was one of those moments that we both were looked at each other like, that is why we made that decision. And there's a lot of people that say it can't be done, and then there's a lot of people that are out there trying and, and seeking it out. And that's the really cool part, is you know sometimes people like in the beginning thought that we were like the one oddball like school that was trying all this stuff. Um, but there's so many people, you know, not even just around the country, but around the world that have come to visit um, and that have conversations with us with making that change. So change is happening all over. Um, the challenging thing with, with people that are trying to make some of those changes is they're making small technical changes. 
um, and not big systematic changes. A small technical one would be, you know, putting in um, laptops or iPads into the classroom, right? And we know that's happening and it's great and I couldn't teach without it. But if you're not going to change your practice, then that's not going to be any more valuable of a tool than a book and a pencil and a paper. Well, there's a lot we can learn from the history of technology because while in some ways what we're experiencing is new, in other ways it echoes some of the things that happened in the past. So for instance, if you look at the electrification of America, um, what was surprising to me was there was initially no significant productivity gains from introducing electricity into American factories. It took about 30 to 40 years, 30 to 40 years, which is like a generation before the technology led to big productivity gains. Why did it take so long? Well, if you go into the factories, what you saw at first, they replaced steam engines, which is what factories were working with in the 1880s, with big electric motors. But they still had them all hooked up to the same systems, the pulleys and crankshafts that powered the, um, the machinery in the, in the factories. Um, simply replacing a steam engine with an electric motor didn't fundamentally change the way work was done. Uh, even when they built brand new factories, they still followed that same model of called group drive, where one motor powered many machines. After about 30 or 40 years, in the 1920s really, you started seeing a new kind of factory being rolled out. And that's what we still see today for that matter, which is often spread over multiple acres. It's a single story factory where each piece of equipment has its own separate motor. Electric motors, unlike steam engines, can be made very small, medium, big, whatever size you need. And you don't need to put the machinery near the power source. You can spread it out. Electricity is easy to um, distribute with wires. These new factories, the machinery was laid out not based on power consumption, but based on the flow of materials. And that led to a doubling or tripling of productivity. So the lesson is that while the electricity is important, I'm not saying electricity was important, by itself, it wasn't sufficient to really move the dial on productivity. We had to combine it with new ways of thinking. That's exactly what we see today as well. When companies are rolling out new computer systems, artificial intelligence, other technologies, too often they seem to do a one-to-one -one substitution of what people are doing currently and replacing it with a machine. The better approach is to rethink what's possible. And I can give you a small example of that. Um, you know, I was just looking at Amazon's market cap. It just crossed two trillion dollars. Well, if if Jeff Bezos had gone into the bookstores in the 1990s and said, "Hey, how can we computerize these? Let's take the cashier out and put a robot cashier where the human was," that wouldn't have been a very creative way of using the technology. In fact, it would have been kind of hard to have a robot do what the cashier was doing. Instead. He stepped back, as did others, and thought of a whole new way of doing commerce, and that's what generated the value. I encourage all the managers I'm working with and the students to think more broadly about how the technology allows us to do new things we never could have done before, rather than a one-for-one -one substitution. So once you have that buy-in from the kids, that interest area, um, they're challenged too. Like it's not super easy, you know. Like they're trying to do. You know, I've got first graders, and they're using multiple different docs, they're airdropping things, they're copying and pasting and searching for images. Like there's so much stuff going on right. that is challenging to them, not too challenging that they're frustrational. But once you get them to you know, want to learn and find that purpose, the management of it becomes easy. And then I could focus my time on just supporting the kids. So for me, it's one, like the beginning when you get a new group of kids or a new class, it's creating those, um, those you know, structures yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's knowing where all the things are in the classroom, right? It's getting them to see that it's our space. You know, it's not just the classroom because we learn in a bunch of different rooms and spaces here. You know, the hallways are learning spaces. They're constantly in the hallways learning. Um, so it's just really talking with the kids. You know, we set up working agreements. A lot of our, um, in our school, a lot of everybody does working agreements. So we're kids, it's not rules, but it's just, you know, commitments of this is, how we're going to be working together, kind of like norms that you have in a meeting. Um, and then like just really, like I said, getting them to see themselves as learners. And it's not me that's telling them what to do, but we're kind of like taking where teachers usually in the hierarchy and it's flattening that. And it's getting down on the floor with them and it's being like, I don't know, how do you think we should do this? What do you think we should do? Oh, that's a great idea. Who has a different way to do that? You know, it's getting in the struggle with them. The LEDs and the administration um, would have, um, 
I don't know if they were called meetings, where they would bring everybody together. And it was almost like a design thinking process for the parents. They wanted input and they wanted feedback from the parents about what do we think about, you know, a specific issue or a question that, you know, is kind of happening at the time. And so I remember sitting in those spaces and kind of going through what my student would go through. You know, they would pose a question and we would all be at round tables and it would be a mix of a parents with uh, LEDs or with administrators and we were all brainstorming and we were all sharing our ideas and we had our sticky notes and we were doing the vertical learning, you know, just like the kids did. And they were gathering those ideas and at the end you saw this array of ideas and, and we would share out those ideas. And then I know that uh, leadership and the LEDs would then take those vertical whiteboards and, and we would see them in the, the spaces where the LEDs worked and they were taking that input from parents and they were taking the input you know, from the staff and, and they were creating. And I thought in that moment that there was a voice here that I felt like it's very different. The, the parent voice is very present in the space. The first light bulb moment, I think the first time we realized we had absolutely made the right decision was we enrolled them in a after school club, which was a Lego league club, which they would go uh, they were doing design thinking and on Saturdays we'd go meet at, a, at a, another family's house that was part of the club and the kids would work on a design project using Legos. And so we went to Legoland and the kids were, everybody was, they would present their prototype and what they built and I think the theme was Mission to Mars that year. So as soon as the judge came around to our group and our kids and started asking questions about their prototype, our two kids jumped in immediately and started to explain how they solved for it, how they did this prototype. Um, sorry. So, so I looked at my wife and I go, this is why we put them at Design 39. Sorry, I always get uh, emotional about this, my apologies. Um, this is why we put them on Design 39, at Design 39. So I saw the confidence in it. They didn't miss a beat. They jumped right in like little leaders. Um, and we're able to articulate why they did this and, and, you know, to a stranger. And I thought to myself, I'm not sure I would have been able to do that in second grade, you know, at the age of seven or at the age of eight. So that to me was the moment where I'm like, we absolutely made the right decision. You see that the kids, where some kids would be really vulnerable in a situation where they're like trying new things and, and finding out what's wrong and then fixing it. The design process has taught them like, it's okay to come up with these ideas try it out, figure it out that it doesn't work, and then go back to the drawing board. And so they're completely, they, they're in a vulnerable situation and none of them seem to be concerned at all about getting things wrong. They're really confident and they don't care and they have their friends and they go back to the drawing board and they figure it out. This is amazing that we're asking these kindergartners their inspiration for their project and the challenges that they had for their projects and all these deep questions that. I would have never thought to ask a kindergartner. Um, and we also, from that experience, realized our son was not that comfortable presenting and answering questions to, to the various parents. Um, flash forward to third grade, he joined a Lego league and had to present in front of judges. And it was amazing the transformation he made from kindergarten to third grade. And he was able to present, look the judges in the eyes, make his point, it, it, we were blown away. Discuss with the kids, you know, how might we do this together? And the big kids are surprised that the little ones are so verbal, you know, which is really <laughs> nice to see. And some of the older ones will be like, oh, I don't know about this little kid, you know? But it gives them, oh, you know, putting the different ages around the table. I mean, that's really how business is. I mean, you'll sit around a table and there'll be all different ages. Right. It is a bigger gap when they're young but you find that that almost disappears when they start interacting more. So it's, it's, it's a nice opportunity for them. Well, the thing I would say to teachers is, please don't get confused about the difference between authority and responsibility. They're not giving you enough authority. And the system is based on authority, principles and assistant principles, all the way down to the teacher who gets told what to do. You're not gonna solve this problem by getting more authority, but, responsibility it turns out they hand that out like candy and if you are willing to take responsibility you can subvert the system in a good way by showing up despite what the people in authority say to bring your full self to work to do this emotional labor 
And that choice is exhausting. You're not paid enough to do that, but that's what you signed up for. So what I'm begging teachers to do is go back to the thing that you are great at, which is not following instructions and administering tests. It's actually being a teacher. Mm, I think it's really flipped for me that I don't have to do everything. I don't have to be the holder of the knowledge. I don't have to be the one who is the one in front. Um, I spend most of my time circula you know, circulating in the classroom. Um, I'm not the one in front, you know, I don't know, speaking all the knowledge. Um, I'm encouraging them to find out how to go get their knowledge, uh, synthesize it, analyze it, and then apply it. I think the biggest one is, is, uh, is the agency that they have, uh, is the ability for them to do what they want, uh, allowing them to make, uh, you know, educated decisions, but yet going through sort of a mini design process in their own head while they go through that. It's fascinating to watch, uh, you know, we for one are not the controlling kind like you know every time my kids want to do something like they come up with ideas all the time they come up with crazy ideas I've done everything in the last few years from running a soap business at home with their maker 39 in school to I think a couple of years ago they wanted to do like my son wanted to make bath bombs uh, and he the kids got together and they made bath bombs and I still remember that our entire living room was full of like dye and, and colors and, and essential oils and all kinds of stuff and it's watching that their learning was messy yet fun and they were able to create order out of that chaos is for them to be able to own that learning right and and have you know the agency to stand up and say hey dad mom this is what i want for me to be able to learn the way i want to learn i think for me the biggest uh, blessing is that ability to have agency and standing up for themselves and and not having to listen to someone else all the time you know let's talk about a company that they were starting and what they should do, um, you know, for their design and color scheme. And he was just kind of listening in the background and they, they were brainstorming on what to do. And he said, oh, I, I know exactly what should be done. And he, and, you know, asked him a few questions, pulled up a site and said, this is your color scheme. This is your design. This is what should go in the background. And my sister and sister-in-law just, they were just blown away and said, how did you know about this? And he said, oh, this is, I, I learned this, I used this during Make the 39, and they ended up using his color scheme and design for their business. Awesome. <laughs> and I, I just stood in the sidelines and was like, how did this even happen? You know, it was incredible. You know, along those lines, my daughter, the same thing with Make Her 39 and that, she looks at the world in a different way. Yeah. All the time she is pointing out logos. Why did they use that logo and that color scheme does not work? Yeah. And you know how she would do it differently. She, she's looking at the world in a really different way through, through a different lens. I think it's amazing that they feel that they have the confidence to bring something right. like that yeah, up. And sure. also that they can contribute. I mean, what an incredible feeling to be able to contribute to the conversation and say, you know, I think it should be another way. So of course there's going to be the everyday math, reading, writing, and, and trying to blur the lines of those in order to make it meaningful for the kids. Um, a lot of the real world experiences. So when we launch into Maker 39, which typically happens around December, we start thinking, okay, how are we going to teach multi-digit addition or subtraction or review those um, and make it applicable for kids and in third grade? So just budgeting, how much are you going to purchase in order to get a return? Um, and that way you're not in the hole and in debt at the end or um, when it comes to writing we have kids creating mission statements for their business and so that gives them the incentive that oh i'm writing for a purpose and not just because the teacher wants me to write about something so um, looking back in our past years with maker 39 we had kids create mission statements for their business. And it, it was so cool because we were able to take a real world mission statement that we found online from a popular company and just use that as a mentor. Um, so the kids know what a mission statement looks like and then being able to really look at the craft of the writer and see, oh, there's a narrative in there. 
there's opinion in there, there's informational in there, and all three in conjunction makes the story so, um, what's that word? It's, it makes the story believable and that people actually relate to it and really wanna purchase that product. And so allowing the kids to see that in the real world and being able to take that and use it as a mentor to guide them in their writing gives them a purpose for their writing. Because it's what are they curious about? What do they wonder yeah. about? What yeah. are they excited about? And yeah. the world is an exciting place and there's some kind of cultural norm that makes learning out to be a bad thing for kids. You know, I have two children of my own. We go to get a haircut, we go to the doctor's office and people constantly are commenting about school. Like, oh, aren't you excited to be out of school for a holiday or for summer break? And my kids, and I've got a fourth and a fifth grader, so they're not like they're, you know, five and six. And they constantly go, no, we like school. And they always think it's so odd that most, it is like 99%, if not 100% of the times, people automatically assume that kids don't like learning and they don't like school. And that's flipped here at Design 39 campus. Our students find learning to be exciting because they're curious, they're interested, they get to ask questions, they get to find out answers, and that leads to more questions. Um, you know, and it's just that whole culture and that nature of, of becoming a learner. It's not about learning the stuff, it's about becoming a learner. And once you become a learner and you understand how to be a learner, then the world is yours and you can do anything. Being good at school, what jobs for the next 100 years of that kid's life are available for someone who is good at school? I have trouble thinking of any. Not surgeons, not receptionists, not uh, people who are chief financial officers or accountants, not bus drivers. None of those jobs are based on, are you good at school? Good at school means you paid attention to the assignment and you did well on the test. But there are no tests. There are no number two pencils at work. So why are we using this method? Well, we use the method because in the 1920s and 40s, it was the best available way to do the indoctrination we sought to do but it isn't useful anymore. And what is useful is teaching resilience and connection and the ability to ask hard questions and initiative and all these things that some people call soft skills, because that's actually what we need. Testing is important in high school, you know, because now we he's getting grades and um, he's graded on that, you know, information. So there's still an importance on that. Uh, but for him, um, you know, he's not anxious about it. It is, it's just a measure of what you know, and if you didn't get it or you didn't do well, well then let's figure out why didn't you do well, um, so that you can, you know, improve in that area. You know, one thing that I saw all the way through design is whenever they would take um, a test or turn an assignment, there was always a rubric with it or there was always um, a, like a sheet that where they had to do the test corrections. And it wasn't just correct the test or correct the problem. It was, what is the number of problem that you missed? Why did you miss it? And then how did you fix that problem? So I think that's very much a part of his test taking now is it's okay, I you know, didn't do well on it, but what do I need to learn? And what's, what did I do wrong this time to do better next time? And it's really hard because they're still define success as you know scoring high on tests and being able to you know punch out those algorithms like that and memorizing this and being able to you know and I'm just like and then what about application what about the creativity what about the design and um, there are some that get it and they understand that integration is important and uh, we try to bring in businesses this you know we ask them when you're looking for a new hire what do you look for you know we want to know and um, they're like creativity, collaboration, please, collaboration. <laughs> um, ha they should be able to talk with people. They should be able to communicate their ideas, share, you know, and contribute. Um, because we have these kiddos that come in from college who have these outstanding resumes and high GPAs, and you get them around a table and you're like, come on, <laughs> you know, so it's almost like they have to, uh, indoctrinate them into what collaboration wow. <laughs> means. And so they say, please, collaboration is a big right. thing. The most important thing that my kids are getting that I did not get is the collaboration. That is something that was uncomfortable for me um, 
as I got older because I didn't have it as a child and it comes so naturally to my children. There's a funny story, my, my kids had friends over when they were a couple of years younger and they wanted, they decided they were gonna make a YouTube video. And my son yelled, okay guys, let's brainstorm. And I just thought, that's amazing. Like how many seven-year-olds are, are telling their friends, let's brainstorm. Um, and so I love that my children are very comfortable collaborating and working with others and working in groups. I think that's such an important life skill. I think we live in a society today where collaboration is a non-negotiable, right? I, I don't think as much as there is specialists, you know, who do certain things in certain, you know, like they're, they're, we're dependent on consultants and specialists in certain areas. Even those specialists cannot get away from collaborating because unless you take that piece of the Lego puzzle and put it with the rest of the puzzle, the puzzle still isn't solved. And so we live in a world where collaboration is a non-negotiable. Yeah, that was a pain point at the beginning because we didn't have a, um, an agreement between the teachers union, so we worked collaboratively with them to define the space and time on how we're gonna use that. But the, behind that is the willingness to just hack schedules, right? right? So we typically uh, have a 54 minute block or whatnot right. in your middle school. We said, let's <laughs> stop doing that. What is it that we need to do for high quality teaching, high quality learning? And there are all these structures are human made, so they can be human undone. And so to create the new reality. And so if we're looking for what does great teaching look like? What does great learning look like? What do students need in that space? What do teachers need in that space? When through that design process, you're able to create systems that allow you to have freedom so that kids have access to deep dives and explorations and there's morning collaboration time still within the contracted time. It's not easy to be a principal either because you are reporting to a board which is reporting to uh, untutored taxpayers. And you may have defaulted to how do I get 100% compliance? How do I exercise my authority so no one here will ever surprise me? Because if I can build a school with no surprises, my bosses, the superintendent, will never be disappointed. But now you're a factory foreman. Why did you, you don't want to be a factory foreman. You can do better than that. And so part of it is challenging the teachers who work for you to never settle for whatever is on the status quo. That the people who should be getting in trouble in your office are the teachers who did nothing that failed who did nothing that was surprising, who did nothing outside their curriculum. That should be failure. Everybody else, the ones we should be celebrating and rewarding are the teachers who showed up to teach. And that might mean not coloring inside of all the lines, but that is what school is actually for. And if you don't think that's what school is for, if you think school is a bureaucratic institution designed to generate people who win soccer trophies and do well on tests, then say it and stop hiring teachers and start systematizing everything. I was at the time a principal opening new schools and I was really, really interested in understanding how do you set the conditions for meaningful change, meaningful development, meaningful learning. And I looked at every framework I could even imagine, uh, different developmental models, I looked at science, I looked at psychology, I looked at everything and over and over and over again, uh, what I found was that there's this concept of social capital. Social capital is what happens when you have relationships and you can exchange information, expertise, and resources. And the highest performing organizations had high levels of social capital. They had connectedness within them and they were able to learn faster because they were able to have that exchange of resources and expertise. It's important to trust each other that we are doing the best work we can and having that grace in that. Um, but it's just, it, it works in a way where when you have people who aren't afraid to just dive in and try something, having that culture of, of teachers um, surround you is so important because that allows you to go oh i want to try that too and it'll be it's okay if i make a mistake or if i fail because they're here to catch me and to uplift me so it's that culture of vulnerability and just being able to go you know what i messed up and let's try it again i define trust as consistency compassion confidence and communication and consistency is really important because when we're 
uh, interacting with one another, there's a degree of vulnerability and having predictability, reliability, integrity, all of these things reduce the amount of uh, risk in our interaction. So consistency is, is absolutely foundational. Compassion is also foundational and compassion is about empathy, it's about curiosity, it's about kindness, uh, it's about actually valuing other people. We're given a tremendous amount of freedom here um, to do what we believe is best for kids. And that freedom comes from a tremendous amount of trust. Change is the only thing that's guaranteed here. <laughs> uh, it's never the same. You have to be open to trying new things. Um, not knowing the answer is okay, uh, as long as you're willing to try to figure it out. Yeah, people often ask me, what can I do? And I like to refer to my, one of my favorite authors, Margaret Wheatley. And she says we need to ask two questions. One is who cares, the second is what's possible. And when we ask the question, who cares, we're gonna expand the circle of inclusion. We're gonna bring in other voices, other perspectives, and we need to engage in a collective conversation to then ask that second question, what's possible? And together, we can do anything. And together is how we're going to do a better job for each and every student each and every learner, that's how we're gonna make the meaningful changes that they deserve. And not that we have all the answers. You know, people ask me all the time, um, are you going to just build a bunch of Design 39 campuses all over the place? And it's like, no, because um, it's more the process that we went through creating the school and that we constantly are continuing using that design thinking to design for our population and for our parents and for our needs and our needs might be a little bit different than some others' needs. So it's not about picking up what we're doing here and doing exactly somewhere else, but the process that we go through, that culture, um, that can then be replicated and um, you know expanded. It's my hope that this documentary inspires us all to learn more about design thinking so that we come together to create cultures of innovation that begin with empathy. One where we better understand each other's hopes and dreams for the future, while also acknowledging our fears about change. Together, we'll be able to create a shared vision for what's possible as we design schools.